The peace of Christ be with you all. If you are in this space, I invite you to turn to the camera back at the back and pass the peace of Christ to those who are tuning in with us over radio and live stream. The peace of Christ be with you all. And we'll trust that we just heard and also with you from all over the world. How many of you, when you saw or heard that today's scripture passage was the passage we often call the sheep and the goats, thought, again? Maybe a few of us? I might have. We, we look at this passage a lot. As Sarah said, this is one that kind of becomes a foundational scripture for us. And I was wondering if there was a whole lot of new stuff to say about it. I was working on a sermon that was fine, but there was something that kept nagging at me. And I thought it was just a distraction, but finally I decided maybe I should set aside my fine sermon and follow it. And it led me down a rabbit trail. So if you looked at the title of the sermon and wondered if perhaps I was confused about today's scripture passage, I was not. It's exactly what we're going to do today. We are going to follow a rabbit trail. I think it will lead us to something that looks not so different from where we've come out before, but the ground might be a little muddier, colors might be a little bit brighter, might look slightly different. Before we follow the rabbit trail, let's read today's scripture. It comes from Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The word of the Lord. The thing that was nagging at me was a footnote in my Jewish annotated New Testament. And that footnote said, shepherds did not separate sheep from goats. <laughs> We've just 
talked about how Jesus took common everyday things and told stories about them. And then the people listening would understand them. So why did Jesus say, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, if shepherds didn't do that? That was really bugging me. And the first place it took me on this little rabbit trail was to look at the herding practices of Jesus' time and place. So let's start with what we know about sheep. And we have a couple of sheep and goat experts back here. I'm looking at you, green girls. So they might be able to tell us some things. What do we know about sheep? They're dumb. Is that a word we can say? Yeah, sheep are not very bright. Um, So you know how the Bible refers to us as sheep over and over? And it makes us feel all warm and snuggly? Maybe we should rethink that. Okay, what else? Yeah? They follow whoever seems to be a leader. Yes. Sheep will just kind of follow along. We saw that at sheep demonst- sheepdog demonstrations this summer. They'll just kind of do whatever the, the one who seems to be in charge tells them to do. What was that, Zeph? They're soft, fuzzy, and cute. Yes, they are, because they, they have a resource we like that makes them soft and fuzzy and cute. What's that? Wool. Yeah. Sheep are really good for wool. Anything else? Yeah, they're pretty, they're they're pretty vulnerable. Right. Their defenses are not strong. I also learned that they are picky eaters. Uh, they, They need a pretty specific diet. Okay, what do we know about goats? They eat everything. Yes, they are not picky eaters. What else? They're ornery. Yeah, they can kind of get into everything. They're pretty bold. They escape. escape. Yeah, because they're good climbers. So if you have a really rocky terrain, the goats are going to get in everywhere because they are fearless and they can climb. Anything else? If you have one goat, what happens? Is it okay to have one animal if, it, if that one animal is a goat, Annalise? No. They what? They'll die. Goats cannot exist alone. They need friends. They are social animals. Okay, so sheep and goats are different from each other. I also learned that goats uh, reproduce more rapidly and that they give a, a better milk supply than sheep. So they are different from each other, and it turns out that they balance each other well especially if your pasture is a fairly mixed terrain. So, enter the practice in the time of Jesus, which was the mixed flock. People now call it mixed herding. So, in Jesus' time and place, a flock would be a mix of sheep and goats. It makes a lot of sense. It's more effective for grazing. It makes good ecological sense. You get a nice mix of wool and meat and milk. And from what I read, a ratio of two goats to three sheep is pretty ideal. We, in our 21st century Christian lens, tend to have this idea that uh, symbolism in the Bible is that goats are bad and sheep are good, but that's not necessarily true. They're not morally good or morally bad. Both are needed for temple sacrifices, Both are needed for their resources. They go together. And the shepherd had no need to separate them. Thus the footnote, shepherds did not separate sheep from goats. So why does Jesus act like everyone knows what he's saying when he says, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats? Continuing to go down the rabbit trail. 
doing a word study, I learned. The term for sheep there is one that's used a little more generically. So sometimes the NRSV will translate it as herd, and sometimes as sheep. But the word we translate in NRSV as goat is more specific. Specifically, a baby male goat. So I asked my husband who grew up on a dairy farm, why would a farmer separate out the baby males from the rest of the herd? You can probably guess his answer. There are a couple reasons. One is that um, if you need to keep your ratio right, you separate out the males so you have fewer little goats running around. But also, the, the male ones are never going to give milk, and so that's why those get culled instead of the female goats. So, when you need to cull the flock, who goes? Baby males. I learned it's also the same word that we translate as the fatted calf in the story of the prodigal son. So, this is a, this is a practice in this time. The shepherd is making a judicious choice about separating out some of the flock to keep the whole flock healthy and balanced. I used to get really bothered by this passage because it felt like the shepherd was doing some segregation. It's not segregation. It's culling the flock for the health of both the herd and the land. Well, I wasn't sure where the trail was going to go. So I took a page from Bob from last week and looked at the characters. So in this story, we have the herds, or the, the ones on the right, and we have the male baby goats, or the ones on the left, but there is a third group in the story. Who's the third group? Anyone? The hungry. The ones with needs. Yeah. And that's the group we don't always pay attention to when we read this story. I wonder if in this sheep and goats or herd and male baby goats story that the hungry might be the, the pasture. Jesus says the needy will always be with you in other places in scripture. This, this is not up for culling. The needy do not get culled from the flock. When balance needs to be restored, the pasture is not the problem. Exploiting the pasture is not the solution for bringing balance. The problem isn't the pasture, it's how we view the pasture. What do they ask? When did we see you? When did we see you thirsty? It's not just something that is there, something to be exploited, to be ignored. The pasture is an integral part of the community. It is the place of hospitality. We're close to the end of the trail, and it looks similar to where we've been before, but we're at a slightly different vantage point now. We've looked at the characters, these kind of three characters or groups of characters of the story Jesus told, but there are also characters behind the text. Who's listening to this story? You have to do a little bit of digging back before Matthew 25, verse 35, <laughs> to figure this out. But this is in the middle of Holy Week. And Jesus is talking with, it's after he's done all of his feather ruffling in, in the temple, and now he's um, on the Mount of Olives and surrounded by his close followers. So these close followers are this group of people that have been going with him from town to town. What have they been asked to do? When Jesus called disciples, what did he say? Leave everything behind. 
and follow me, yeah. So if we think about who is sitting there, who's about to go into the events that we know are about to happen, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, and then the events of the early church that happen next. This is a group of people that has been dependent upon the hospitality of others and a group that will be in prison. So who do they identify with in the scripture, in Jesus' story? Maybe with the pastor. Maybe with those in need. Or maybe they identify with those in need and with those who have the power to help. We tend to identify with those who have the power to either help or not help. But we are all part of the integrated community. We're all part of this field, this pastoral setting. And I wonder what happens if instead of viewing this as a checklist of things that we must do, ways we must help, and instead see it as a picture of community, a community that God helps keep in balance, We can trust God to cull the community for the long-term health, and we can exist simultaneously as those who need help and those who have the power to help. But that requires vulnerability. We do not tend to lead with our pasture selves with our needy selves. We bring our prettiest and most put-together selves to the family of God. Our go-to is to mask our fears and anxieties with righteous anger, to mask our loneliness with smiles and good cheer. We mask our struggles with, well, I'm doing well, thank you, and how are you? It is so much more comfortable to see ourselves as the powerful helpers. But it's not honest. We are often the stranger. We feel lonely. All of us are lonely at times. We are overwhelmed. We are confused. We need comfort, we're sick, we face trials. We and those that we love struggle with broken relationships and addictions and mental health crises. We carry heavy burdens of anxiety. And it is so hard to bring that part of ourselves to this place. But for the balance and the health of the community, we must. What does it mean to give and receive? To hold our longings in the same breath as we hold our rich resources. What does it look like to let go of the much more comfortable savior complex and exist in a much more complicated but far more healthy and sustainable community. I'm going to leave it here with these questions. You may head a little farther down that trail of complexity. I hope we all do. I hope we keep finding those rabbit trails. But for now, we are going to sing a song that I think captures this coexistence of needing and being able to help, of being the pasture and being the herd. Number 715 in your Purple Voices Together book is Longing for Light. And we'll sing all the verses. 
If you are able to stand and sing, or if that feels comfortable to you, let's stand. <laughs> 